Okay, thank you, Ben. So you've heard about how we pull all this stuff together digitally to make it available online. Now we're going to have a treat. Um, my other partner in crime is uh, Professor Hamish Maxwell-Stewart. And Hamish is actually going to talk about you know, the use of the records, the linkage of these records with other record sets, both uh, elsewhere in Australia and elsewhere in the world. And what does it all mean? And it's an amazing little journey that we've had in this space. And I won't talk for too long about this because I'm sure you'll cover a lot of this. But basically, a couple of years ago, we went to a theatre performance at the Theatre Royal in Hobart. Uh, David Walsh, he's our Lord of Darkness, uh, the, the man behind MoFo, had uh, sent Lee Carmichael out and about to see the launch of an educational resource, which was all based upon 20 particular convict stories that a local mob called Raw Film had uh, developed and put together in a multimedia way that's, so that students could actually engage with the stories, not so much by having to consult textbooks and records if they weren't that way inclined. There was a lot of storytelling. Uh, Mick Thomas, Weddings, Parties, Anything, prominent Australian muso. His brother Steve is one of the brains behind Raw Film. And so those two got together and put it together. It's almost like an MTV style thing. So anyway, Lee Carmichael liked what he saw at the launch and so basically we had Tim Rogers, we had Mick Thomas, we had, uh, oh, Kit, oh, we had all sorts of people, didn't we? Ben Salter come down and basically it was almost like liberating the stories of the past because of the convict stain having such a long impact on Tasmanian society. It really wasn't until the 1980s when people like Ian Pearce and Robin Eastley and Bill Taylor championed the cause to make those records publicly available. And so we've now, with technology, taken it into another realm by virtue of the digitisation. And so I'm now going to hand over to uh, Professor Hamish Maxwell-Stewart, who is Professor of Social History and Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Tasmania, to tell us more. Um, and a bit of a play on one of Governor Arthur's uh, particular administrations, I see, Hamish, in the way that you've actually titled uh, the, the presentation. So over to you. Um, Ross, thank you um, very much. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk that much about our collaboration with RAW, but since you, you raise it, um, I will say that I do have a, um, a, a notice on my, on my door at the university which says, uh, my project was made into a musical. What are you going to do with yours? <laughs> um, I never thought in my wildest dreams that something that I worked on would end up in the Theatre Royal and would have a three-tier standing ovation as well. Um, I hope that that's a sign that some of the things that we're doing are feeding back in very positive ways into um, Tasmania. Um, I would also like to echo um, Ross's thanks to Bob Sharman. Um, without um, Bob moving those um, combat records from the Sheriff's Office into the safety of the Tasmanian archives, I, I hate to think where we might have, might have gone. Um, and after thanking Bob, there are some other very important people to thank. The Australian Research Council. Um, I've been extraordinarily fortunate with applications to the Australian Research Council. Now, part of the reason for this, um, I know, is because the work that we've done with Convict Records has been different to the work that um, our competitors at other universities have done because it has resulted in things like projects with archives, interpretations at places like Port Arthur Historic Site, collaborations with family historians. It's because we've been able to drive things through to um, impact that the Australian Research Council has um, kept faith with us. I'd also like to thank the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK, who recently gave um, me and our UK collaborators a grant worth three million Australian dollars. So that's the, the kind of money that I just couldn't hope to um, acquire for research within the Australian system but in Europe it is possible. Um, other collaborators, of course, include the Tasmanian Archives and Heritage Office, but standing behind them, um, Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery, Team Mag, Port Arthur, and all of the other local heritage sites, which are very important players in the story that I'm going to tell you. And also the family historians, particularly the female convict research um, group, a very, very active group of, um, of people who have about 200 volunteers worldwide who now harvest data for us. Um, if we need to get a record from um, the Scottish Records Office, for example, we can get it transcribed overnight now, which is fairly incredible. So we can respond to media, we can respond to, um, for example, um, queries from who do you think you are very, very rapidly. 
And here are my academic collaborators, and I think this is an important part of the story too. Um, I work with demographers from Melbourne University, Janet McCalman and Rebecca Kippen. Um, Rebecca is particularly important because she brought with, um, with her to the project um, a database of all Tasmanian births, deaths and marriages from 1838 to 1899, and I'll, I'll describe later on how that fits into our project. Um, after that, I have the Old Bailey online team. Barry um, Godfrey is a criminologist at the University of Liverpool. Deb Oxley is a, an economic historian. Many of you who know about convict records know that the, the important part that she's played piecing together particularly the female convict story. She's at the University of Oxford. And Bob Shoemaker and Tim Hitchcock are the academic geniuses who put together the Old Bailey Online. So anybody who's seen the Old Bailey Online, they're, they're the team behind it. And those are the people that we collaborated with on a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council called Digital Panopticon. And the aim of that grant is to um, answer a question that Jeremy Bentham first posed. So Jeremy Bentham argued that it was um, better to incarcerate people in prisons in the British Isles, better in terms of outcome and in terms of economic cost, than it was to transport them to Australia. And so we're going to test Bentham's hypothesis by following the outcomes for those convicted in the Old Bailey who were sentenced to transportation and went to Tasmania and Western Australia, and those who um, were not transported, who spent time in jails in Britain. And then finally, I've got a group of economists. I work very closely with economists, particularly health e um, economists. And as I talk on, you'll see why that that's important. So Mardi Dungy from the University of Tasmania, Chris um, Inwood from Guelph, and a guy called Rick Steckel from Ohio State University, who is the only person I know who's had their face on the front of Time magazine. So it is actually possible to be um, an economic historian and get yourself very widely recognized. Um, my first slide is of a diagram that I did for the Australian government some years ago when we were trying to put together a serial nomination for Australian convict sites. And what I did was try and fit those convict sites to a schematic map of how the convict system worked. So what we were arguing was that the sites that we were putting forward for um, World Heritage Listing were a clean cross-section through the experiences of convicts. And this is a very good way of telling you how the convict system worked. So this is the, the male version of it. And all convicts arrived at that point. So off the vessel, they either sent to be assigned to a private settler, or they went to work for the public works. Now, in the language of the convict system, what happened to them afterwards depended upon their behavior. So the emphasis was very much on them. And that those that messed up, those that refused to work hard, those that refused to learn the habits of industry would slide down the system if they were male through the road parties, chain gangs, and penal stations, and to ultimately perhaps the gallows, whereas those who bent their backs, kept a still tongue in their head, and did their master's duty those that improved, those that reformed, would earn a ticket of leave, which would give them the, um, the ability to work for um, a wage, and then would slowly progress out of the system towards an early freedom. So the emphasis is very much on the, the conduct of the convict. Now, what's interesting about this is how few walls there are in this system. So I've tried to, to capture this by using data from um, Tasmania in 1839. So this is a, a miniaturized version of that large schema that you saw. And what I've got is um, a Venn diagram of how every convict was deployed in Tasmania, every male convict, in December 1839. So the gray on that circle is convicts who were experiencing punishment at that point. And so we can map the gray points onto um, our stepped diagram of the convict system. In December 1839, 9% of male convicts were at Port Arthur, 4% were in um, chain gangs, and 11% were in road parties. Approximately a quarter of all male prisoners were un undergoing some form of punishment, mostly in the open air. There were 
very, very few walls. Contrast this with the 34% that were assigned and the 25% that had tickets of leave, which were working in the private sector. This was an open air community work order system. Um, governor Arthur, Governor of Van Diemen's Land from 1824 to 1836, described it as a, um, an open air panopticon, using Jeremy Bentham's phrase for an all seeing um, prison. So a, a remarkably free system. Um, so there we got the, um, the assigned, and there we got ticket of leave. And here's a, a female version of the same thing. As you can say, there are even less walls in the female version of the system. So the, the proportion of female convicts that were ever in um, a female factory or in a female factory at one particular point in time was really quite small. So let's take a, a more detailed kind of look at how we represent the convict system. So in Tasmania, it's dominated by Port Arthur. And there are many good reasons for that. I mean, Port Arthur is architecturally very, very impressive. But there are also dangers that Port Arthur was a minority convict experience. It was a very, very important convict experience because even if you didn't go there, you knew about it. It helped to keep convict labor at work in ways which were profitable for colonial society. But nevertheless, it's not the image of convict society that would have been recognizable to those that actually experienced it. Convict Tasmania looked much more like this. So here's John Glover's um, famous My Harvest Home. And we know that the majority of people depicted in this painting are, in fact, time-serving convicts. And, in fact, we can use um, the muster for the year after this painting was finished uh, to have a good stab at naming who they might be. The architecture in the Tasmanian convict system was made of paper, not brick and stone and metal. Uh, this is a fairly good example of one of those records. It's um, a record called um, a Con 18, um, a descriptive register. There are many things which are really pioneering about records like this. Um, one of the ones which um, I'm most impressed with is, is the police numbers that were given to convicts starting really in the early 1820s. Uh, I, unique I identifiers which help to join multiple records within the very, very large Tasmanian convict archive together. It's relatively easy to follow one convict through the system. And indeed, they were followed too. So this is the, the front of the British Hue and Cry, um, a periodical which was circulated um, to the police, um, uh, regional police forces, in the British Isles, but was also circulated to colonial authorities all around the empire. And on the front page, you can see a list of convicts who have absconded from Van Diemen's Land, together with their physical descriptions taken from those Con 18 records. In fact, we know an awful lot about transported convicts. I think they're the most documented people in the British Empire. We know the color of their eyes. We know how tall they were, something I'm very interested in. We know the tattoos, scars, and injuries on their bodies. Um, the, the Tasmanian archive is a huge, huge um, record of the impact that machinery had on 19th century working people's bodies. It's also the best record that I know of of 19th century tattooing practices. In many cases, we know the species of the worm that infested their gut. How do we know that? Because they had medical records. Uh, medical records were kept for them on the four-month voyage to Australia. They're all in the, the National Archive UK. We know incredibly how much money was in their bank accounts. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. We know where they were born. We know the names of their brothers and sisters. We know where and when they were tried. We know when they were treated on the voyage to Australia. We know every 
stroke of the lash that was applied to their back, every day that they spent in leg irons, every day they spent in solitary confinement, every day they spent on the treadwheel. And we know when they became free, although there are some problems with following them after they became free. Now, the real powerhouse of the bureaucratic apparatus that ran the convict system was um, a record group um, called the Black Books. There are actually several different volumes of the Black Books. If you add them all up, there are, I think, 222 volumes in total. They contain 660,000 individual lines of data. Um, this is a, a, a typical page from the um, early 1830s um, black books. Um, the top record is for a convict called um, Gao. It's David Gao. He was um, a collier's boy from just south of Glasgow. And I've transcribed out here the, the contents of that record. We've done something similar for 4% of the male convict records. It's just over um, 20,000 entries. And we're nearly completed transcribing out in full all of the, the, the main content of the female um, convict records. And Port Arthur have had a, um, a long-running and very successful project transcribing the records of convicts that were at Port Arthur as well. Now, what is contained in these records is the date that each convict appeared before a magistrate's bench or other court, the location in which they were employed at the time, a summary of the offense, um, a record of the punishment or the sentence that was applied to them, and the initials or name of the magistrate who heard the case. And sometimes there are other details added to the record as well. So if we look at that May 16, 1832, uh, Gao was assigned to a man called Murray. He was tried for gross insolence, and he was given 25 lashes and returned to his master. And the magistrate, James Simpson, heard the case. And if we follow down this record, you'll see that there, he has several further encounters with Murray. And then he's sentenced to um, the public works. He's sent to a road party. He absconds. He's given 50 lashes. And then after a while, he's demoted to a chain gang. And you can see that on September the 27th, 1833, while in Notman's chain gang, he was tried with inciting his fellow prisoners to insubordination and refusing to work and given 50 lashes. And then he climbs back out of the chain gang, back up to being assigned, and then has several further adventures before, remarkably, at the bottom of the record, and I'll read it out for those who can't see it, the lieutenant has scrawled on the bottom, in other words, the lieutenant governor has been pleased to grant this man a free pardon and 50 sovereigns for his praiseworthy conduct in apprehending Benjamin Ball, a desperate character. And so Benjamin Ball is a bush ranger. And so he gets out of the system, perhaps by a, a surprising route. Now, one of the things that we can do with a convict like David Gow is actually look at his progress through the convict system over time. So he arrives and he's assigned, and then he goes to a road party, then he's assigned, then he goes to a road party, then he goes to a chain gang, then a road party, then a chain gang, then he's assigned, then he goes to a road party, then he goes to a chain gang, then he captures a bush ranger and he gets out. <laughs> Imagine doing that for 70,000 people, <laughs> because we can. Uh, you know, that is the kind of detail that's um, in encapsulated in this um, remarkable record group. I'm going to sort of take a different tack now for a bit. I'm going to tell you another story from the convict system, quite an alarming one. Um, we have a, a, a remarkable set of convict narratives that were written by a kind of 19th century version of Al-Qaeda, except rather strangely, they were all, well, the bulk of them were American. Um, this was a, a group of um, kind of Freemasons um, wild Republican Freemasons who took it into their heads to invade Canada in 1837-1838. Um, um, they didn't do their homework on who the governor of Canada was. He was um, George Arthur, the former government, governor of Van Diemen's Land. Um, Arthur had these people, those he didn't execute, he had them tried at special tribunals. 
and shipped to Van Diemen's Land, um, um, AKA Guantanamo Bay. Um, several of them actually ended up working in hospitals. And they independently describe going into the dead houses in those hospitals and seeing dissected remains. So seeing the remains of um, prisoners and how that when prisoners were taken to a grave, and this is a, a very, you can see it's a very graphic kind of metaphor, that nobody knew exactly who was in the coffin. So the convict went into a nameless grave, something which reoccurs again and again in convict stories. But also that you didn't know whether there was one person in the coffin or several after the surgeon had done their work. And the complaint here is that this should have been illegal, that you could only be dissected if you were sentenced to, to death by a court, and the court actually ordered the body to be handed over to the surgeon. But in Van Diemen's land, there were no kin to reclaim the bodies of the convicts who died in the system. And there were repeated allegations, um, and we have a lot of evidence from other sources, that this was considered one of the perks of the surgeon's job that they got to do um, anatomy classes um, on the remains of prisoners. But one of the things that I kind of like about this story is the way that it's a reminder of the dissected nature of convict lives. Um, it reminded me of something that the French philosopher and historian Michel Foucault said about convict systems or prison systems. He referred to something called the carceral archipelago. A reminder that a lot of the, the records, despite their detail, are in fact actually very, very um, not family friendly. Prisons are not designed to be family friendly. When a prisoner goes inside, they are split away from their family. And indeed, as you can see in the, the central image here, as the 19th century progressed, prison systems try to split prisoners away from other prisoners, away from their working class connection, something that you can see if you go down to Port Arthur very visibly. And indeed, although we talk about the convict records of Tasmania, the convict records of Tasmania are part and parcel of a whole set of records that any prisoner transported to Van Diemen's Land is likely to have accumulated. So many of them were arrested more than once. We know this from their Vandemonian records. They went through various court systems. They went through prison systems um, both before and after those trials, and records were accumulated. They went through UK Hulk systems. There were vessels, uh, uh, there were records kept on board the vessel. And when they arrived in Van Diemen's Land, they were described both um, before they left the vessel and then when they entered the prison barracks or the female factory to await allocation to various places, more records were taken. And as we've just seen in the case of David Gow, that there are more records still as they progress through the system. There's a chain of records, a really complex chain of records. Sometimes the bits of those chains fit together quite well. Sometimes they don't. What is interesting about the records is that parts of them tend to follow each other round the globe. So in fact, the convicts transported to Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania, um, have included on their records snippets from records kept in the UK or on board the vessel. So somebody has taken a version, something that they've seen on a previous record, and they've included in another record. However, you're never sure what the original record actually said. There's a whole kind of archaeological process that you can undertake, piecing together the sequence with which these record groups were put together. So you can use what's in the Tasmanian records in order to try and put the Tasmanian prisoner's life into context. There is information, so I've just told you, about where a prisoner was born and about their family. However, prisoners of course, do have a vested interest in trying not to get the state to follow them in great detail. We know that they don't always deliciously tell the truth. Lies are fantastic things that they tell you a lot about motivations, etc., etc. So there are two problems, I think, here. Although we can, in theory, follow prisoners from cradle to grave in extraordinary detail, 
linking records, particularly records from before a prisoner is incarcerated and after they're released to their prison record is a bit of a challenge. It's a very, very important challenge, however, because, and I think this is the, the really, really crucial point, we ought to remember that the prisoner's life is recorded in the wonderful archives um, records that we have here in Tasmania, for example, is not the life of the prisoner as the prisoner or their family would have seen it, but it's the life of the prisoner as the state um, chose to record it. And that's a very, very important qualifier. Now, I'm going to move on to talk to you about, um, some. I think, some of the dilemmas of this particular approach. Um, this, I think, is one of the great objects of Tasmania. It's a grave board. It's in the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. It's made from hue and pine. Um, I first encountered it when um, the curators from the Queen Victoria Museum um, discovered it. It had been sitting on a shelf and wasn't actually in their catalogue. So that they, they called me in when they did the move to their new museum site and said, Hamish, have you seen anything like this before? And it was, they assumed that James Thomas was a free person. It was a free person. It says, actually, on this grave board that they were accidentally killed while falling from a rock on Sarah's Island. Well, Sarah's Island is actually part of Macquarie Harbour Penal Station on the west coast of Tasmania. Um, I knew that there was a burial record for Sarah um, Island. It's actually in the State Library of New South Wales in the TAS papers there. And I could piece together the rest of the story by going into the Tahoe record collection. James Thomas was a convict. In fact, he was one of the convicts that was involved in a very, very daring robbery of the colonial treasury. But kind of what worried me about this is a bit like the anatomized convict body. All of the parts of the story were stored in different places under different custodial groups. Um, when I first encountered this grave board, it was very much in the, the early days of um, the digital revolution um, as well. It was kind of like a, a struggle to fit all of these bits together. You had to go to Sydney to find the burial register, for example. I'm pleased to say that we did actually get this, this grave board into the National Museum of Australia for a while. Um, I think that what curators and historic site custodians and archivists have been forced to do in the past is pretty much follow what the prison did. We're very, very good at putting things in the right pigeonholes. So what we tend to do is to curate record groups by the, um, the departmental body that actually developed the record groups. But sometimes what we do is we put them back into their metaphorical cells, that you stop somebody from actually drawing the records together, so it's putting a, an individual's life into a wider context. Though, as many of us are aware, that one of the, the powerful things about the digital revolution is that it's now possible to curate things in ways which protect the record, but also enable them to be seen by many, many people to make those digital collections which join different parts of an individual story together. So let me talk to you very, very briefly about the main project which I'm involved with. It's called Founders and Survivors. And what we're trying to do is to link together the 75,000 records for the convicts that were transported to Van Diemen's Land. So the trial records, Hulk records, and voyage records um, that relate to those individuals before they actually hit Tasmania's shores. Um, and then link those to the convict records of Tasmania, and then link the convict records of Tasmania to the birth, death, and marriage records for Tasmania, whether those are parish records or their civil records, and then bring in um, other groups of records, including records which relate right up to the early 20th century, First World War enlistment records, for example, and arrival and departure records for Van Diemen's Land, in order to trace not just what happened to convicts, we want to follow convicts from cradle to grave, but also, because we're slightly deranged, their children and their grandchildren, and also a sample of people who arrived who were not convicts. So to follow the descent lines for convicts, 
and for free arrivals to do an intergenerational study on the long-term impacts of forced migration on the individuals who arrived in Australia. We want to know whether transportation um, extended convict's life expectancy or cut it short. We want to know what the long-term effect of solitary confinement was, a very relevant question. Um, there have been no studies on the impact of exposure to solitary confinement on life expectancy, for example. And there are absolutely no studies which follow through on the implications for the second generation of a life which is messed up by extreme exposure to solitary confinement of a parent, for example. So what happens when um, you spend uh, months of time deprived of contact with somebody else sitting in the dark and then you go on to form a family? How does that impact upon your ability to raise those children? Um, there are also kind of like positive effects as well. There are lots of reasons to believe that being transported from industrialising London or Manchester or Sheffield and being given the opportunity to raise a family in glorious Tasmania might have actually been beneficial. And so um, one of the things that Founders and Survivors wants to do is to follow through those implications. It also gives us a chance um, to work with people like Ancestry and Find My Past and um, Taho. Um, one of the first things that we did on this project was that we took 60,000 digital images of convict records and then we indexed all of them and we handed them over to, um, to Ross um, and his team and then Ross carried on digitizing those and then working with Ancestry to digitize those and we see our job now very much as extending the amount of information which is transcribed from those digitized records and helping to piece them together like an elaborate jigsaw. The Founders and Survivors data set now has 1,300,000 lines of data on Tasmanians, um, who, well, people who were in Tasmania up until 1918. So there's the new Tahoe um, name search site, which I'm, I like trying to break um, these search sites by putting John Smith in. Um, this one deals with John Smith so well. Um, you, you can actually find the records of a John Smith that was put, um, transported on a particular convict vessel. You can find their marriage record. You can do all kinds of things. So you can go um, straight to the image of the record that, um, uh, in many cases, that we took in the, in the early stages of Founders and Survivors. Um, I'd like to go backwards with this. Um, we're starting to have fun taking the descriptions that convicts um, convicts um, said, well, convicts were asked to describe their, their family. They were asked to provide details of their next of kin. And so this is a, a family um, as revealed by James Douse, who was transported with his brother, William Douse. So these are all of his sisters in pink and uh, brother, Richard Douse, and his father, James Douse. He failed to give the name of his mother. In fact, it wasn't clear that his mother was still alive. But we found the family in the 1841 census. So, I mean, we'll be able to do this with thousands of convicts. Um, what is interesting about this is it gives the sibling order. So we, we'll be able to re retrieve the ages of all of his brothers and sisters. We found that the mother was alive, in fact. She was called Sarah Douse. We've got the occupation of the, um, the, the mother. I'll just go back. And we also have... The church, we know where they were, were the, the actual house in, in Church Street, Saffron Ward, and we can actually find out who their neighbours were, if we so wish. We can also do forward um, linkage as well. Um, there are just over 14,000 Tasmanian-born um, men and a small group of women who enlisted in the Australian um, Imperial Force during the First World War. Um, we've done, done a, um, work on a sample of just over 2,000 of those. Um, we know that 0.2% had a convict mother and 1.3% had a convict father. But these are the percentages that had um, grandparents that were convicts. And in fact, in all, 52% of all Tasmanian-born um, AIF 
have at least one convict ancestor. And we can go back another generation as well. So that's the great grandparents and the percentages that have convict records. So why on earth is this important? Well, it means that we can do that kind of intergenerational record linkage where we can follow all of these individuals from birth till death, and we have remarkable records for them. Now, let me um, give you the main reason why somebody who has had their face on the cover of Time magazine wants to work with my team. Um, it's because Tasmania is the only society that he can identify in the world that has height records, birth records, and death records for the founding mothers. So it's the 13 and a half thousand convict women that were transported to Tasmania, which I think are the real jewel in the crown of our collection. They are very, very important. Women are far more important than men, and yet they often don't get into the archive. <laughs> And of course, the AIF, although male-dominated, has very, very similar records to the convicts. So we have another population where we have height, hair color, eye color, and we have weight, expanded and unexpanded um, chest measurements. So what we want to do is to link those two records together to look at the long-term social and health impacts of convict transportation. We really want to know whether transportation dumped the descendants of convicts into poverty traps or launch them um, up the social um, hierarchy. Some of these questions we can answer. Um, don't panic if you're um, extremely, sh or you're shorter than average or taller than average. Your height is overwhelmingly determined by the genes that you inherit from your parents. But Early childhood experiences and our experiences in utero determine the extent to which we can reach our biologically programmed potential. In Australia to this day, there is a height gradient between the wealthy and the poor. The only place in the world where there isn't, by the way, is um, Scandinavia and the Netherlands. Um, a lot of evidence that um, people in, um, in that part of Europe have actually um, reached their biological potential due to um, very, very advanced um, welfare state systems. Well, what we can do is use historical height measurements to measure the extent to which past populations were stunted. And so the first line, the bottom line I've got on that, is the height by age curves for convicts transported to Tasmania. Uh, the next line, the um, solid gray line, is the heights for um, prisoners arrested in Tasmania in the 19th century who were born overseas and arrived free. The line above that is for 19th century arrested prisoners who were born in Tasmania, the majority of whom have convict ancestry. So you can see that they're actually taller than the prisoners who came as free migrants. So this is the first evidence that, in fact, if it was better to be born the child of a convict in Tasmania, then born the child of somebody who was never transported and lived out their lives in the UK or in Ireland. So there does seem to have been at least a biological intergenerational advantage conferred on people by transportation. And then we have the First World War cohort. And then the final line is the 2009 UK um, health survey, uh, survey. So you can see how people have grown in stature over time. Um, there are some other very, I think, very important implications for this kind of intergenerational work. They tell us something really important about the way that we're telling the convict story. So I'm going to talk to you about who amongst the convicts married and had children. Amongst the women, the 13,500 women, all, the majority of them married. Those that survived their sentence, the majority went on to marry. Amongst the male convicts, it's a much, much smaller proportion so because of colonial sex imbalances, it was harder for male convicts to form um, a, uh, to find somebody to walk down the aisle with them. And we're doing a lot of work on trying to work out what it was amongst male convicts that um, enabled them to find um, a female partner. And indeed, what, perhaps not surprisingly, we found that it's the skilled non-Irish and those on short sentences with short punishment records that tend to marry. 
and they go on to have descendants. Not actually very many children. Um, 0.9 registered children for every marriage involving a female convict. It's really small. Um, part of the reason for that is the way the state polices the sexuality of female convicts while they're under sentence because it wants them working as domestic servants. So they tend to marry late and they have small family sizes, which is one of the reasons why their children are taller. It's because they, there's more resources to go around in those, those families. But the, the bottom line here is not so much what's happening on the female side, it's what's happening on the male side. If you went to Port Arthur, if you were punished, the likelihood is that you actually went into one of those nameless graves and you don't have descendants. The descendants of transported convicts did not have the Port Arthur type experience by and large. They worked out on farms and businesses, etc., etc. So the image that we promote of convict society um, doesn't gel well with the experience of the descendants of convicts. And I think that there's a, a really important lesson. There's something that we've got to fix in that, that story. There's another aspect to all of this. I said that what the 19th century state wanted you to do was to concentrate on the individual and the failings of the individual. When you look at thousands of records, when you start analyzing them, you see a wider picture. You can start to see the state in the crowd. And some of the things that we're doing actually are starting to reveal another side to transportation. So if we look at the chances that you're going to end up before a magistrate's bench and be sentenced to a flogging or solitary confinement, we can see that that changed quite dramatically over time. It, your chances of being tried doubled in the 1830s if you were a convict. Now, I don't want to get too much into why this was the case, but it is that the, the, the chances of being brought, brought before a magistrate are inversely correlated with free wages. And the reason for this is that as free migrants came to Tasmania, they were competing with convicts, and the more choices that masters had, the more likely they were to punish an individual because they knew that they could be cheaply replaced. So what you do is you get more turnover. So in other words, the length of a convict record tells you something about the personality of that individual convict, but it also tells you something about the state of the labor market in Tasmania. And at the moment, that's missing from the family history story. You can show this more graphically here. The blue and the green lines are the number of days per man in the system that convicts spent on, in road parties and in chain gangs between 1818 and 1856. Now, you can see it creases over time. This is a system that actually gets more physical over time. But historians always get interested when you see wave-like patterns like that. So we tried to work out what was driving this. And we found that it's very closely correlated with the cost of keeping a convict. So that is the, the price of clothing and feeding a convict over time. And of course, in the private sector, that's what masters had to do. They had to clothe and feed a convict. And we think what's going on is that as it became more expensive to do that, uh, masters attempted to take convicts to the magistrate's bench, get them charged, and remember that magistrates are also employers of convicts, get them charged and sent to a road party or a chain gang because then the state pays for the increased cost and to hire a free worker instead. So you get these kind of oscillations that move with the, state, the, the, the economy. And perhaps not surprisingly, affect the death rate for convicts as well. Not just because road and chain gangs are more physical, but because convicts are housed together in more confined circumstances, so the infection rate goes up. So again, all of this matters. So putting an individual story um, into a context, a wider context, I think is a very, very important thing, and a big challenge. I think that um, that's one of the, the really exciting things that we ought to be doing in the next decade. So I'm now going to quickly wind up with my last two slides. <laughs> I'm going to um, very um, quickly run through um, convict bank accounts. This is kind of right rough slide because we're just piecing together bits and pieces. I'm staggered at how many different convict bank account records there, there are. Many of them 
are actually in the State Library of New South Wales collection. They're in the, the TAS Papers collection. So we're, we're digitizing those and piecing them together with what we've got in the Tasmanian system. We have um, a chain of records which um, tells us how the surgeon superintendent collected money from convicts on the voyage and then handed it over to the state as, uh, as well as convict property, all kinds of different objects. And then we're being able to, to map how those went into savings banks along with wages from the convict police. 90% of the police force was staffed by time-serving convicts. And how the state deducted, if you ran away and you had money in a bank account, that money was deducted to pay for your reward for the person that apprehended you. <laughs> so there's a kind of interesting way in which the convict system was incentivized. And then finally, um, what money was withdrawn at the end and how that influenced marriage, migration, and subsequent offending. So those, I think, all very, very important questions that we'll be able to follow once we piece together the bank accounts. So final slide. There are lots of challenges in rebuilding the prison without walls. Ross has already talked about the real importance of bringing together the original Tasmanian archival collection um, distributed between the um, State Library of New South Wales, the National Library has an important collection, the Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. So digitally, online, putting all of those records together. I'd love to bring in the objects that are in the museum collections, 3D laser scans of leg irons and things like that. And I think digitally online we can piece all of those together. And of course, if that is the paperwork engine, if that is the physical apparatus that run the, ran the convict system, then we ought to actually connect that with the actual sites themselves. We should tell people when they access a convict offense record, the different locations that that prisoner was in and make it possible for them to find out information about those sites, go to those places. We should, of course, connect the convict records of Australia backwards into the UK criminal justice system and into census records and newspaper records as well. We should also connect it into related record groups in Tasmania. As big as the convict record um, is, it's only a quarter the size of the Colonial Secret Secretary's Office correspondence files for the period 1824 to 1836. That's just the Arthur period. That, that record group is stuffed full of information which helps to contextualize convict records. And then we've also got the ongoing what happened to the descendants of convicts. And I think really, if you want to rebuild the prison without walls, you do have to go much further than the convict collection. What you've got to do is to recreate the lives of those people from cradle to grave as it is represented in the archives and then beyond in order to see how that experience impacted upon the descendants of convicts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamish. We've got a bit of time for some questions, so uh, I've got our roving mic, so would anybody like to kick off? Um, as you'll be able to tell from the tweet storm around this, this presentation, we loved it to bits, so thank you. The thing I'd like to ask you, though, um, particularly in the context of the discussions which are crossing the archival world in Australia particularly, around the Royal Commission into um, the, the, what actually happened to children in care, and the difficulties of extracting those records and the trauma that they are literally producing when people find themselves in those records. Do you have any qualms looking at this group of people in the convict records um, ab about reintroducing the scrutiny that they in fact endured through their lives to them at this distance? I, I can see the value in what you're extracting because it's amazing, but um, I wonder. And I, one of the reasons I asked that is because we actually looked in the um, you know, long ago exercise of trying to recover women from historical records. One of the things we actually decided to do when we were, we were um, analysing Tasmanian convict women records was that we refused to give their full name to try and give them some semblance of privacy at this late date. Because as you point out, these people came to the attention of the records and the record keepers because of what they had done transgressing the local laws. 
So I was wondering whether you had any of those kind of qualms and, and, and how you respond to that. Um, yes, we do. Um, but I think that the way to do it is not through concealing things. It's by revealing more. And um, particularly what we want to do is to reveal the mass picture. Because the, the mass picture is the best way of showing the state in action. And if you can see the state in action, then you can, um, in a, a kind of like strange way, you can give the individual more agency than the state actually wanted in, in, in the first place. Um, I sometimes say to my students, I'm not interested in um, identifying bastards in the past, so people that have, have done awful things. What I'm interested in is trying to recreate past motives. So the forces which actually push people into doing um, X, Y, and Z. And I think the big challenge with this is, is, not, um, is not preventing people from discovering what's, what's in their individual um, family's archive. It's putting that experience into a wider context, telling them that just because X is, is on the record doesn't mean to say that that's what actually happened to the individual, that there are multiple interpretations of that. Put it this way, um, I tell my students that there are no such things as historical facts, that the past is evidential in the sense that any piece of inf information is open to multiple interpretations. So it's putting those multiple interpretations out there which I think is the important thing to do. Hi Hamish, thanks for your paper, it was really terrific. Um, I teach uh, the teachers history curriculum in Victoria and the national history curriculum has a very small um, part devoted to convicts and hardly anything at all really. And I can't seem to get my students who are going to become history teachers interested in convict society. So I'm really hoping that this project is going to somehow be linked in with the National History Curriculum. Are there any plans for that? Yes, it's already underway. So um, um, Google Founders and Survivors Storylines. So that's the project that we did with Raw Film. Um, um, I'd like to do a lot more um, on top of that. And can I just um, echo, and this, this, is, um, this is not getting at school teachers at all, but I'm really amazed at how many students I encounter at university who say, tell me that Australian history is boring. You know, and, I, and I look at them and say, I came from the University of Edinburgh to Tasmania because your history is so interesting. And, you know, but but the, we, we do have a wider problem, but we're, 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 somehow we're managing to undersell um, what an important, interesting, vibrant, connected place um, 19th century Australia was. Got time for one more. Um, yeah, I, I'm struck by the rather brilliant programming of the conference and the contrast between uh, Dr. Julie Goff's talk and your own, because we are talking about the same period in Tasmanian history, um, totally different experience of working with the records. I mean, you're working with a kind of wealth and surfeit of records. Julie is working with uh, fragments, uh, suggestions, uh, lack of any kind of uh, traceable trails. There's no ID numbers that she's working with. Uh, you're working in a large group. She seems to be working by herself. I, I'm really, really struck and fascinated by the differences between those two histories that are going on um, at the same time in Tasmania. And um, especially with the way that those histories are connecting with particular places um, and the geographical significances and layers of significance of place. And I'd be really fascinated to see if there's any way of linking those two stories or perhaps just contrasting those two stories going forward um, to try and bring them somehow into the same frame, despite the methodological challenges, really, of doing that. Um, yes, there are. I'm really sorry, actually, that um, this is an apology from me that um, because of university um, demands that um, I haven't been able to come to the conference, so I missed um, Julie Goff's um, paper. Um, there's, of course, a reason for the disparity. I mean, we know a lot about convicts because the state wanted to know about them, and um, the lack of information about um, Tasmanian Aboriginal peoples is, is in itself revealing. I, I think that there are ways forward through this. Um, something I didn't talk about is the, um, the GIS dimensions of all of this. 
And so mapping, I think, is extremely important. At the moment, one of the things that we're doing is dropping all of the original land grants onto the map of Tasmania. Um, I would like to drop all of the recorded encounters with Aboriginal people onto the same land uh, m map. Um, we're not particularly surprised about this, but land grants weren't given in geographical sequence. They were actually dropped onto the, 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 the land grant map of early Tasmania looks like Swiss cheese. And the reason for this was that land grants went, went down on areas that had been cleared by fast stick farming. And indeed, it was the, the hilly country which is, is left out of the picture. That's the country which is later settled by working class um, 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 individuals. So there's, there's a, a, when you actually map these things together, you can actually start to see ways in which parts of Tasmania's history which are less well recorded fit in with the stuff which is much, much better recorded. Um, I look forward to working with Julie and lots of other people in trying to um, extend the, 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 the weight of the archive into the kind of like dim areas around the edge of it which are less well lit. We can do that. Thank you. Right, Hamish, I know your, your passion is strong and your energy levels are high, but also I know your days are long. And uh, we really appreciate you making time to come here today to talk about your research. I mean, we're quite blessed here because we get to do this all the time. Um, but on behalf of the Australian Society of Archivists, thank you so much, and here's a token of our appreciation. Thank you.